going to be it. I'm the only one listed anyhow. Uh, I'm Jim Warwood. I'm uh, the Washington, D.C. law firm. I'm speaking on the camera. I've been the, on the Alliance National Board since 1990. And I represent local governments and community media centers and the occasional uh, big producer. And yeah. I've been doing this kind of session always with at least one other person. At conferences for a number of years, though, and uh, essentially, you know, the hearing to deal with whatever kind of questions you have, and legal, political, and so forth. And each time we do it, it's uh, kind of completely different. Sometimes it's spent almost entirely on you know, uh, copyright issues, other times it's franchising issues, and uh, it's going to vary. So, you want to start? Jim, let me ask you what well, right, your last name? Forward. Could you, or, could you talk a little closer to the microphone? That's okay. just for the tape. Okay, H-O-R-W-O-D. Yeah, I'm actually listening to the program. Oh, okay, yeah, good. The only one is there. Can we turn you up a little bit? Sure. It's starting to walk. To it's getting a little bit of a ring there. It's ringing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, well, <laughs> okay you want to start? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, is fair use still in, is fair use of copyright material still in play, or did they change for something about that church? I don't think fair use has been changed at all. Of course. What's yeah. been evolving over the years on copyright? A lot of people have come up with Creative Commons copyright, which uh, kind of says that uh, you, you can use my material uh, yes. uh, in, our, in, in these kinds of ways. And usually it's only a limitation that uh, you, know, you have to use the whole material. You can't uh, have to take excerpts, uh, but, uh, or you have to give me credit for it. But, uh, you know, a lot of people who have copyrighted material want other people to use it, and the Creative Commons copyright uh, is a way to do it, and all it is is a way of labeling uh, something uh, as a copyright, and then they, they tell you what, you know, how, it, how it can be used. Yep. When, when uh, I, I use, for community television yeah, purposes, I use uh, excerpts of material off the internet quite often uh, and almost always from a otherwise published agency or organization that it puts it up there for use. For example, I'm doing a story right now on uh, our Orange County Fire Report and it's mutual aid with other fire agencies, CAL FIRE and so forth across the state. Well, OCFA and CAL FIRE put up these little short video excerpts on their websites and I'm just presuming they are for public. Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, you, you might want to uh, check with them. And if you check with them, then you've got, uh, obviously, the ability to, uh, or you, then you don't have to worry about anything. And, and most people are going to be allowed to use it. Uh, some of the limitations you might have with uh, Creative Commons copyright can't uh, use this for profit, it's for a non-profit purpose, but uh, I've, I've not heard of this have, the kind of thing you're talking about having been a problem. Uh, the usual issues that uh, we deal with are uh, how do you deal with it. And uh, the, the main advice we would give is we want to be on the safe side is uh, have uh, local musicians uh, come in and perform their own compositions and have a release from them. But the uh, NCTA, National Cable Television Association, has, uh, has blanket licenses with uh, PMI, PMI and ASCAP uh, that allow for the use of copyrighted music as background music. On the cable system, and that includes the access channel. They, they pay, pay a fee, and that's it. It covers everything on their system. And the 
know, they want to cover the access channels because they don't want to be uh, liable for what goes on their system. Uh, the problem comes if you start synchronizing that into a uh, into the production itself rather than the background music. It's a different kind of license, and that's one where you uh, should get uh, get a cop get copyright permission. I'm not sure what you mean by synchronizing. I got. I think I know what you mean. It means like, for instance, like if you just, like if you have like a specific production and you use like music for a particular scene, you know, that's a form of synchronization. You just said the background music, you know, as the background music is not as easy, easily synchronized. Synch synchronized music is more direct. And, and and one way around it is to buy a music library. And if you buy a music library, then you can use it. Uh, pretty much however you want. And you know, the issue that we are trying to deal with uh, is what happens if you have something on your channel and it's covered by this blanket license and moving on to the web. And uh, I don't think that that uh, blanket copyright allows you to use it over a medium other than a cable system. So if you have to uh, then get permission to use it in, oh, over the internet. Uh, so if my station, uh, I'm with Los Alamos Community Television in Long Beach, Orange County, California. And if my station uh, maintains a uh, website as, as well as our uh, primary tier channel 3, uh, that is considered a different medium and therefore subject to different copyright. Yeah. I, I believe that's it. It's, you know, we're not clear on that, but I guess we would urge on the safe side of this that you know, don't, don't put on uh, anything that contains copyrighted music, even if it's only background music on your website, unless you're dealing with music you have clear rights to. So if it's something that goes back over, forget the life of the copyright, uh, it's you know, 100 years or so. so uh, somebody's performing something written by Stephen Foster, you know, you're, you're fine. And, uh, it's a symphony concert, but the performers itself have a copyright, so you have to get permission from them. So that, that's why uh, the idea of using uh, is the local music, musicians, either their own material or something that's in the public domain, uh, is the safest course. Well, I'll tell you what our station manager says, but his considerably not legal advice is, which is, unless you're unless you're in a, uh, a profit motive position where you actually can be sued for something, uh, your use of music, uh, unless it's egregious, unless you're using uh, Michael Jackson's uh, uh, bad soundtrack or something. Um, Owned by Sony, uh, the likelihood of you being sued is about one in ten million. Yeah, I, I guess. You know, my my advice is, you know, as a lawyer, you can't do it, but as a practical matter, I'm sure if uh, if they don't have an incentive to go go after you, uh, you know, the, the most likely thing is something is being done and somebody objects to it, and they uh, ask you to stop. Then you stop, and uh, the kind of an adage it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. And uh, so, you know, as long as you're uh, in some reasonable basis and, and think you can use it, I don't think you have to worry too much about getting hammered. Uh, you know, this one no no is uh, if you're trying to use something that's uh, Disney, uh, you know, don't oh, okay. you know, because they will come after you. But, uh, yeah. Most people you know, don't care, and, and they want you to use. Uh, well, you know, just parenthetically, uh, I, I have, uh, I know where that line is, at least on the website, and that line is defined very, very matter-of-factly by YouTube. You put something up on the website that is otherwise copyright uh, protected, uh, and YouTube will kick it back at you and say that you have used. Uh, uh, Material that is not authorized for the website, and 
they will ask you to take it down or they will take it down. And if you put enough programming up on the website and send it to YouTube and they kick it back, kick elements of it back, whether it's the you know, video uh, or audio, uh, they'll take your site, they'll take your site down. Well, that happened recently, that happened recently with us and one of the reasons I always tell everybody uh, know, you know, know which labels own what. Because uh, because you, if you know, if you have a feeling of which labels, you know, which distributors own what, then you have an idea of how to uh, go ahead, how to go ahead and tackle it. I was, um, I did a documentary about the 40th anniversary of the uh, uh, United Farm Workers crossing over from West Sacramento into Sacramento, and I there was like a lot of there was like three songs I that were great that I specifically wanted to use. And the first thing, I, first thing that had to happen was that I had to know where, you know, where these where these were and how to go about using them. How to go about using them and getting permission to use them. If you end up doing that and you explain what you're using it for, sometimes the fees are just like very minimal. Uh, if you plan on if you plan on using it like it's going to be like a big part of your of your production, then the fees then the, those fees are uh, are, are expensive. Like there was a uh, the one of the songs we used was by this group that was called Los De Abajos, and they were on they're on Real World, which is a part of EMI, and so then I had to contact Real World, and then they sent me directly to their public they sent me directly to uh, the publishing company you know, the uh, the license the music licensing department of EMI. EMI quoted us a price of uh, 300 because we weren't using the whole song, we were using the section that we needed. And also, it, it also in that way, we also ended up giving them uh, a credit it, uh, a credit and listening to everybody else in, 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 you know, at the end. And it was the same, I, we had, I think most of the one that we had to get the music for on our thing was uh, Santana. He had, um, there was a song he was on, he was on Island when he released the song. And Island is under Universal, which was then Polygram. And yeah, I mean, see, you got, I mean, see, the thing about this, you got, to, you got, to, you know, like everybody says, like you can't be, like, you know, if you're trying to use your music, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to stick this in. You, I mean, look at the back, look at the back of those CDs, and you, and you, you know, you look at the back, you'll see. <coughs> and if your uh, information is inaccurate, you do a web, web search and see where they are. Because over in December, EMI got EMI. The uh, music, you know, like the CDs and everything, got bought out by um, got bought out by Universal. Well, the music publishing, the sheet music and everything else, got bought out by Sony. So you got you got to go to two different companies to get those things. So you, it's, you know, you gotta know. I just forgot. I think I just heard that when I look at the copyright, somebody has something copyrighted. It's their, their intellectual property, and if you're using it without paying them for it. And you're really stealing something from them, yeah. so they're they're entitled to compensation, but there are, there are exceptions. If you uh, you know there's a fair use exception, or if you're using it uh, as a parody, uh, that parody is part of fair use. So there, are, so some ways it can be used. But and one thing that I hear about with some access centers is you have a high school production, a uh, cabaret, and uh, if you want to show it on the channel. Can't do that without getting the uh, permission. The well, high school can't perform cabaret without uh, paying some kind of copyright. But if it's going to go on your channel, then you've got to get additional permission. But uh, copyright fees, uh, my sense is, aren't going to be that expensive if you're using it in a non-commercial uh, venue because the people who have the copyrights want it to be used. They just want to be. Uh, be compensated, and the amount of compensation is going to depend upon who is using it, how, how widespread it's going to be in, and this is why it gets a little bit tricky when you're moving onto the web because you're disseminating over a much, much broader area than uh, just your local community. Okay. Just as a follow up, um, can I ask? So, I'm sorry, if we, uh, I'm Sean Bluffman, uh, at Access Humble. Um, but the liability for that, I guess, I, I, to trace the liability, because there's the producer's liability, 
which is, and then there's the access organization or the jurisdiction's liability. And it seems like that liability, if you structure your access organization correctly, the liability stays with the producer in a way, regardless of whether they take it to YouTube. But if, you, if we post it to YouTube for them, do we incur? You know what I'm asking. It's like yeah. d discern who's got what liability and how to how do you how do you compartmentalize? Let me say it. At the start, your producer agreement ought to require the producer to you know say you say that he's got the copyright permission on that, and if he doesn't, to spell out what the compensation is. And that kind of and it runs against the theory that. that Speech and if you're going to require an identification from the producer, then you're impinging his speech. But I, I think that's reasonable for you, is that basically that one producer can't use this this way. If the producer does infringe on somebody's copyright uh, and, uh, and you're held liable, then the producer has to identify you for, for that. You may be covered by your insurance policy, but if you have a good agreement with the producer that uh, tells the producer, you know, you're not allowed to do the following and the producer agrees not to do that, then that ought to be very helpful in any legal defense by saying, you know, we, we did everything we can. We you know, we're running a uh, public forum here. We don't uh, look at what it is that's presented to us. And, you know, the most we can do is to uh, advise people what's, uh, what's not permissible and they get them to agree that they won't do something that's impermissible. So then for a follow-up, if, if I'm an advocate for producers saying, okay, we're trying to make it as easy for you, it's on you, it's not on us, if you get a problem, it's your problem, it's not our problem, so then you can be fairly loose in your, important. you don't have to really enforce once you get the front end. But say I want to help the producer reach other audiences without incurring my own Liability. So it's a two-part question. One is, if I post it to YouTube for them or online for them, have I opened, if I've done the posting for them, have I incurred some other liability? That's part question. And the other part is, it, um, New Meat. There are organizations like in California that help producers who got takedown notices from YouTube to f keep their stuff on YouTube. So and uh, New Media Rights, you know the, the um, Art Neal, those guys. So they do pro bono. There's free legal services for independent producers who get takedown notices from YouTube. So if you disagree and you think YouTube is not, that you have a fair use argument, I think you can get pro bono legal service. I suspect it's not with California Lawyers for the Arts that I think also provides uh, some pro bono legal service. Uh, and that's, yeah, if they don't, don't, don't go the same way. But, you, know, you want to have a producer agreement that tells the producer what should be done. So, and, and I think you'll find that uh, most producers, although some will push the edge, will say, okay, uh, I, I now see I don't want to you know, take a chance, so I will do things in a slightly different way. Yep. You know, from the producers, and I. Oh, I'm, my name is Ben Kamara Reyes. I'm the Access Supplemental and the Media Lab Manager. And from you know, being a producer myself, I produced uh, action adventure soap opera for nearly once a month for nearly 20 years. And I knew that we had a good run. But when, at the beginning, we ended up using recorded tracks by uh, Tangerine Dream and Patrick O'Hearn and uh, Larry Fast because that their style of music suited our backgrounds a lot. But what happened was that, like, uh, when, I think about the time when Napster came out, that's when everybody started ringing in their copyrights. So what I ended up doing, I ended up, you know, teaching myself, you know, how to, you know, like, you know, there's a music library at our station. But I ended up teaching myself how to use uh, Asset Music Studio. And at the same time, uh, since, we're, since ours is a Mac facility, learn how to use GarageBand. Uh, the blanket agreement I, I realized about them, with, especially with, uh, I think Asset is a little bit more looser than GarageBand because Asset, you buy the libraries, they're like bits and pieces of the music and they say like you compose the music 
that music is yours. You can't credit the artists who have created. You can't exchange the, uh, you know, the software you need to use to build it. But as far as like you making original compositions out of those loops that they provide, that's uh, that's another form of royalty free. You can use it in anything that you want, but you can't say the artist did that. Okay, this gets around a little bit like the Creative Commons license. It's, you know, whatever the license says that the, you can do or can't do. And as programming has moved on to the web, I think we will see uh, additional issues uh, Issues arise, particularly to the extent that uh, this becomes more ubiquitous and people start, start looking at these programs on the web. Does the, uh, in my particular case, I, by the way, I'm John Underwood from Los Alamitas Television, LA TV 3 in Los Alamitas. Uh, 
What was this case you cited? Uh, I remember the title of it. It was, uh, it, it was, a, it was in Austin, Texas, and it was probably 20 years ago. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a program, and why I didn't think it was uh, obscene, it was a program about safe sex, and it showed the, uh, the use of condoms, but it showed the use of condoms in a very explicit way, and it was, uh, and it was two men uh, engaged in sex and, and how condoms were going to be protected. And it was on for uh, you know, like three or four minutes, but it was part of a two hour program. And, and that, that's why I didn't think it was legally obscene, but you know, that was, it was understandable to me how at least a jury could find it, uh, that it was obscene. obscene and, uh, but that, that was yeah, very, very explicit. But, uh, Do you already recall the, the title of it? Uh, I, 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 I don't remember. We had a similar case that happened with us uh, like that in the, in the infancy of Access Sacramento. And uh, what had happened was that we had this, uh, we had this, it was on our uh, public access channel, we put a disclaimer in the front. And what had happened was that uh, it came on. It came on a lot. You know, it came on like it was what the FCC deemed uh, safe cover time, which was I think about like 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. And uh, resident. It depends. 11 p.m. Sometimes it's 10 p.m. Yeah. And uh, what happened was that uh, it had simulated sex. You didn't see the act at all. And uh, a couple of you know a lot. Uh, one late one resident over in uh let's see, a suburb of Sacramento where she complained that it was on. And then the thing that was interesting about it was that she all she presented this argument, what if my kids saw that? Now when it, when it aired, when it aired her kid should have you know her kid would have seen it, that would have known that their kid she wasn't doing parenting because it aired on a Thursday night, late at night. So, <coughs> on a school night. So, what's the kid doing now? <laughs> but anyway, what happened, the end result was that it got a big reduction in our funding. Mm -hmm. we, we were going from, I think we had like a 424000 dollar annual budget to about like 255000 and we worked with that until the um, the uh, executive, the, the the guy who runs the uh, cable division. You know, he you know when he left, that's when our funding got completely restored. This is for Sacramento. Yes, this is for Sacramento. <laughs> the name of Spasto doesn't ring a bell, does it? No, I think it was I think it was like the executive secretary, executive director. I don't know, but it was just like. It was like we were, you know, it was, the thing about that was that I, you know, I think after that case, I remember about that case, and uh, I can't remember the name of the show. <laughs> um, what you have is that there have been efforts by Congress and others to uh, keep indecent programming off of the uh, peg channels, and indecent programming is programming that's sexually explicit, but that doesn't reach the point of being obscene, and we've argued consistently, you know, Indecent speech is uh, protected speech, and you can't prevent it. Uh, you can deal with it in time, place, and manner. And uh, having a safe harbor uh, at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. is probably uh, <coughs> probably work. It's you know safer to have it at 1 a.m. But uh, 10 p.m. or 11, and it's, it's the theory is you want to protect unsupervised minors from viewing this program and you know, they, they shouldn't be up at that time so you know the idea of keeping off this programming because some kid might be uh, watching it if it's uh, indecent but not to the point of uh, being obscene uh, that really violates the first amendment rights of uh, whoever it is is putting on the programming so basically have the first amendment you've got free speech and then there are 
some limitation to obscene speech as in protected speech, but indecent speech, it's less is protected speech, but you can deal with that uh, in time, place, and manner restrictions. And you know, what do you do if you're running a public access channel and you go free screen programming, which you shouldn't do, I and mean, get into why you shouldn't be doing that. And uh, you know, there you basically you know, tell people that you know, you're not allowed to put this kind of, you know, you hear the ground rules, and then if somebody violates the ground rules because they're putting in something that's obscene at uh, 9 at night, uh, you know, then, then you can suspend their uh, privileges from being on your channel. Yeah. You, you speak of time, place, and, and, and manner. Yeah. Matter. <coughs> uh, matter. Time, place, and manner yeah. matter as yeah. far as what is considered perfect on cable community television. Does any, to any extent, does the, does the uh, federal communications recognize or uh, identify local, uh, and there's a phrase for it, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, local community standards in the application of that definition. In other words, if you've got a community that's a, uh, let's to use an extreme example, let's, 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 say, let's say there's local community television inside an Amish community, yeah. and they have a certain community values system. I, I think that would only reach the point of obscene programming. I don't think that you're dealing with something that's constitutionally protected, but what is obscene would be very different in uh, Los Alamitos than it is in uh, San Francisco. In San Francisco, they did real problems with program content, but they, they kind of let it go on and they take taken some of the, I don't know if they have this now. The one real nice thing about the advent of the internet is we don't hear about these kinds of complaints. Mm -hmm. that, there are the outlets, yeah. Yeah, because they're, they're able to kind of put it on the internet. And I haven't yeah. heard a complaint about the supposedly I've seen programming being on Access Channel for years now. Or there, oh, and you got sexting. Yeah. So sexting took yeah. over. So there, 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 are, there are other avenues, which is kind of, you know, one good thing about having this alternative uh, space. But you know, the one way it's been dealt with when people have had uh, defensive programming, and the Access, manager the Access Channel called in the programmer and said, well, you have a right to put this on, but uh, I'm going to get all kinds of hell from the city council, and uh, you know, that may cause us to have to lose our channel. And you, know, you might want to reconsider whether you want to push this at, at this time. And you know, generally, that's been a successful approach. So you know, rather than saying hey, you can't put it on, so, I, mean, I recognize you can put it on, but uh, I would like you to think more about it. And here is the potential consequence, and, uh, and you really want that to happen. So a lot of times, these people who are going to push the envelopes will uh, still do it. But other times, you'll uh, have uh, people who don't know, you want to push it in. In, Ch in Chicago, there was a, a, a problem. A, some producer had a problem with the access center and something with the rules. So he decided to put on uh, for an hour uh, a screen with the words, fuck you, Barbara. Barbara happened to be the manager of the Access Channel. It was about uh, 8 at night, and uh, her attitude was, OK, uh, it's protected speech, it's not obscene. And uh, so she allowed it. And then he kind of came back and uh, decided we're going to run another program, but this one had fuck you, Barbara, with a blue background. He's going to do the green program saying he has an additional program here. <laughs> what does she do? And I, I, I suggested there, well, gee, for people with black and white television sets, it's the same program, so you can tell them it's the location. <laughs> and he took it down, but that was the case. But that was Chicago. Yeah, that might not work in uh, Los Alamitos. But, uh, okay, it's well, awful that he's doing this thing, but okay, he's got a right to do it. And, uh, yeah, he did it, and then he got tired of it after a bit. Well, we actually, but, but, but they have five channels, so uh, 
we actually had LA TV taken off the air because of a well through a series of events, but primarily it was it was initiated by a Korean uh, television show right. in which the producer, a a you know local laugh laugh factory producer, got up there and met at, at before ten o'clock and uh, sat and did uh, stand up his stand up shit in the diaper. And some of, the, some of the jokes were pretty blue, and uh, some of the oldsters in town, it's a city of 12,000 people, very old city, of Orange County, mm -hmm. um, objected to it. And the mayor, uh, who was in a conference in San Diego at the time, called into the city and told the city manager to uh, take the program off the air. This guy sued. Went to the ACLU. Yeah, it was a bad reaction. And was he successful? He was. You're right. right. And that's why LA County lost their public access? No, this is this Orange, this is LA TV, Los Alamitos Community Television in Orange County. Okay, okay. You're, you're talking about Channel 36 in, in, in Los Angeles? Yeah, because. No, that's another political. Uh, I thought that was a political issue, right? Yeah, because I was really surprised when I found out that LA County has no public access. LA County or LA City? Was, this is, LA 36 was a city. Elliot, 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 they don't have public access. But they don't either. Um, I'll, I'll give you one other example. Uh, you know, a bad example was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, back uh, a little while ago. They had somebody who did a uh, program with a penis puppet. And it was kind of the head of the penis and was kind of talking. And it was uh, kind of a clever and interesting <laughs> and, and, and Grand Rapids is a very conservative city, and uh, the guy got sued. The, the access center, fortunately, didn't get sued, but they did. They went and uh, prosecuted the, the programmer. The access center was supportive of him. It just didn't violate the rules. It clearly wasn't obscene, and uh, in that case, uh, like they lost in the court, and the producer was able to get the ACLU to try to get the U.S. Supreme Court to hear for it. Very good pleading, and we, I think, on behalf of the Alliance, or might have been the Alliance for Communications and Democracy, and, uh, and perhaps the Access Center filed the front of the court brief in support of the producer, but the Supreme Court didn't hear the case, but uh, and that was one, but at least they didn't go after the access center. The prosecutor went after the uh, uh, this poor producer, and it was uh, actually kind of a clever program. It was uh, the kind of thing you wouldn't even realize that it was ahead of the penis if you, if you hadn't heard it. And, uh, the rest of the trial, so you, you have that that kind of uh, problem can happen. Yep. Can you back up and tell? Because I'm sorry if I interrupted you. What happened with the person who was in the diaper doing a stand-up, and they sued and they won? The, co the comedian who was doing the show, his own public access show, mm -hmm. uh, was in a diaper and he was doing uh, just some stand-up, uh, fairly blue material, a lot of comics do, you know, nightclub type ad. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, elders of the community in Los Alamitos uh, objected to that called the city manager, who called the mayor, who was out of town, the mayor remotely from San Diego said, pull the plug <coughs> on the program, not the station at that moment in time. And so it was pulled. Uh, the comic himself sued the city of Los Alamitos because the city owns the television station. And, uh, and the board that manages the television station uh, served at the pleasure of the city council. And that's a very important legal term on which the whole thing rides. Yeah, yeah. the really mayor made the call. I mean, the mayor made the call. Yeah, I mean, it's the mayor did the action so, and pulled the show. Unfortunately, in Los Alamitos, there were people who, it was also election, uh, the up, run up to election, the mayor himself wishing to get a second term running up against a very stiff opposition because the mayor himself uh, happened to be a, 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 a police chief from a city that, uh, well, city, city of Bell. Oh, oh no. <laughs> are you kidding? So he 
he wanted LA, and we had announced that we were going to do candidate interviews for that particular year, 2006 it was. And it just was handy and convenient for him to just simply say, well, let's not stop with the show. Let's take LA TV down. And then they said, you know what? It just so happens we're, we're trying to do a, uh, we are uh, trying to do an assessment of LA TV equipment. So we're going to the station down while we do a inventory. While we do inventory of the station. And I asked, as, as studio coordinator, I asked, well, how long is that going to, is the station going to be down for? And they said, well, until after the election. Yeah, you know, there's somebody who would have a good first amendment. Yeah, so, which I wonder if ACA you got involved. Yeah. Um, I was, at the other session, I was talking about a situation uh, we were involved in a few years in Palestine, Texas, where, where uh, there was a uh, guy named Joe Ed Button, who was a member of the city council, a guy who worked on oil rigs for uh, a couple months, or a couple weeks out of the month. And he had his own, he was on the city council, but he had his own public access program. And uh, the public access program was kind of critical of the city at time. But one night he had like a two hour video of the cars parked overnight you know, illegally that never got ticketed. And he was a real thorn in the side of the rest of the council. And they didn't like him. And uh, their solution to get rid of his program was to, uh, closed down the public access channel. Fortunately, there was enough of a paper trail on why this was done, unlike uh, what usually happens. If you have a pretty good lawyer, you can hide uh, your real motivation. But here the motivation was, was pretty clear. And uh, we had uh, the devil of a time getting uh, the ACLU to find a lawyer, for, local lawyer, for us to work with, but we did. You know, we, tried that case and we brought an action against the city for violating free speech. Uh, you know, among the other things they did as well, you know, there was some religious programming on uh, public channel and they certainly didn't want to eliminate that so they kind of put that on the government channel. Uh, just different issues and but we, we were successful. We got a, a, a good federal judge who ruled that you know, when they shut down this channel in order to uh, prevent his free speech. Now, what, you know, when you lawyer it up correctly, your grounds are doing it to save money uh, and you can't afford to have the two channels. But here, uh, it was pretty obvious that they wanted to shut this down because uh, they didn't like this program. And it's one of the few times I've dealt with programming that was uh, controversial that uh, Wait a minute, you know, nobody can really find this offensive. It's just kind of this you know, political commentary that didn't, uh, didn't cause, uh, there was you know, no nudity. It was uh, pretty simple. And as I mentioned the other session, uh, Joe Ed was a pretty conservative good old boy from Palestine, Texas, which was kind of in the middle of nowhere. He said, I you know, now realize that uh, if you have the First Amendment, you don't need the Second Amendment. So, uh, yeah. Indecent speech is protected, of, uh, obscenity is not. Yeah. So do you have, or, or what would your advice be uh, to uh, a station manager who's confronted with uh, you know, a situation where somebody alleges that something that was on late at night is obscene? It's certainly not the uh, executive director that can make the determination. Yeah. What, what do you say to People who are in that in that circumstance, what what is the steps they should do? The, the, the producer, who, or not the producer, but somebody in the community who doesn't want it. Well, it's a, yeah, yeah, somebody in the community brings it to the attention of the executive director and says, "Well, this is obscene." Uh, what what well, would you say we, should be done at that well, point? Well, ho hopefully, we've got the uh, decent city attorney and basically say. Uh, and go ask the city attorney, or go bring this to the attention of the city attorney. They're not going to want to touch it, or uh, say, or you can let the thing run, and then afterwards uh, you go to court and get a determination that this was obscene, and if it's obscene programming, then uh, the producer has, has violated the law, and that can be dealt with. But, uh, you know, and 
situations that I know of, and anybody who's you know, going to a city attorney, I can find a city attorney who knew what he or she was doing and said, you know, this crosses the line, you can't put it on. And generally, you don't, if it's kind of close, then it's really a decision by a jury or judge. But, uh, you know, so, you know, so, so sometimes it's so extreme, but you know, generally you don't know. If somebody brings in a program that found to be obscene and some other place and wants to run it on your channel and that that's easy but other than that saying you know, we're, we're not the ones to, to make that decision so so you suggest directing the person who has a complaint to the city attorney either the city attorney or uh, you know, go go to court and uh, get an injunction uh, from running this and basically say if, if you have a court telling us we shouldn't put this on we won't but, but, but we're not in a position to make this judgment. It's really a uh, court that should do it, and that's what a good city attorney will do, unless something mm -hmm. goes uh, beyond the pale. But uh, that, you know, that just doesn't happen. The most extreme thing I ever saw was that one program in Austin, and, and that one uh, I thought it was a, I thought it was a close call. I, I could have easily defended uh, the programmer uh, because of context in which the material was presented. But, um, f functionally, though, your recommendation for the, in that case would be similar to somebody's claiming that it's slanderous or the, and that they had some other legal, so any legal concern somebody raises to you and says, this is violates this law, the Access Center's best response is, hey, we're not the, we don't make legal determinations. You get a legal determination, we get a, we get a court order and it's yours, you know, we pull it, whatever. But we don't. We're not the judge. Yeah. <coughs> Essentially, what you're doing, you're operating something that you say is a public forum, and uh, you know somebody uh, wants to uh, do something we've seen in a public park and gets prosecuted. Uh, but, but again, it's you know, for the prosecutor. You know, times will get an aggressive prosecutor like we had in the Grand Rapids situation, where the prosecutor was very determined to uh, convict this guy and the prosecutor was successful in that case. Shouldn't have been, but was. But the, but the Access Center was uh, kind of harmful on it because they weren't the one making the judgment. They were providing the forum. Right. I guess I was going to say we found that to be very effective and most people will scratch their heads and try to figure out if they can get a lawyer and if they can get a lawyer might hear something from their lawyer, and then you'd be like, oh, okay, I got a letter from a lawyer, but it's still not a decision by anybody. And, um, but but it's, uh, it does come up. I think the only time we've ever had, a, in my experience, in places that are maybe more gentle in a way, was a subpoena maybe for a cut of video back when tape wasn't, everything wasn't so distributed and online and available everywhere. It was like, you're holding a master tape and somebody wants to review it for a, civil court proceeding or something, it's, ev it's evidence, you know, for somebody, in which case we responded to that subpoena or whatever it was, or they, you know, there was some kind of legal order and yeah. turn over a tape. But if they came to you and asked for the tape, you wouldn't give it to them, uh, but say, if the court tells us to, you know, fine, we, we'll follow what the court does, and, you know, sometimes uh, you don't want to take a position in the court that uh, if they bring this kind of, uh, some kind of complaint against you, you just inform the producer. That, uh, this is your problem, not, not our problem. I have a question that sort of dovetails into this issue. Currently, uh, and it sounds like we've got nothing but problems at LA TV, but we do put out some pretty good programming that, that is direct and out of the community. But uh, of late, uh, well, even for the last few years, uh, there's been a producer at LA TV who produces our sports program. Los Alamos High School is very well known. The Los Alamos Griffins are CIM, you know, contender every every season, basketball, football, very sports oriented community. But we have a strong public access and nonprofit history too, and they utilize LNT as well. The sports producer has approached the city and has asked the city to dissolve the commission, appoint him as nonprofit corporation to take over LA TV and turn it and, and then turn LA TV into a uh, essentially advertising based operation uh, 
uh, rate cards and all, and and justifies it by saying it's the only marketing model that LATD can survive with, and he's the only producer who can make it happen. We have a remote truck that goes out and gets assets in that area. Um, and wants to essentially dissolve public access because for among other reasons he can't he can't turn it all over. So he wants to turn LATV into a quasi, really probably a full-blown advertising-based television station for local uh, consumption, and uh, turn it into essentially a, a little micro ESPN. Okay, I'm not sure on what the DEFCO regulations are on this, but when we had locally negotiated franchises, every franchise uh, I'm aware of, and certainly everyone I negotiated, uh, provides that the channel would be non-commercial. And the cable companies insisted on that because they don't want you taking this channel that uh, they're providing you know, for free as part of the franchise and using it to compete for advertising revenues against them. And there's something in the Federal Cable Act that provides for commercial leased access, which uh, requires channels to be available for commercial programming on the access. And they're the cable operator gets compensated, but uh, you know, if you have a standard, uh, standard franchise, uh, you know, that will almost invariably say it's uh, non-commercial, and I don't know what GIFCA says. I suspect that GIFCA requires the channels to be non-commercial, and usually what you get into them, if it's, uh, it's non-commercial, you're still allowed to, to do underwriting, and, uh, so it's you know, not as if you can't do some kind of uh, for fundraising, uh, but, uh, and the kind of model of the kind of what we suggest and what people suggest is you know, use it as the PBS model because that's you know, they're able to raise money in ways that deem to be non-commercial, but he's selling advertising. Yeah, you know, that's clearly commercial, and that would. Uh, violate every franchise I'm aware of, and I, I'm pretty sure it would violate uh, DIFCA. I can't imagine that the industry would have allowed DIFCA to get uh, enacted uh, without and, and permit you to use these channels for, for advertising. Well, DIFCA, as you mentioned DIFCA, this producer quotes DIFCA. And okay, but he probably misquotes it, but go ahead. Well, there's a passage in DIFCA law that says that that television, that, that local community cable television, peg stations, shall be non-commercial, except for the fact that they should, that they will be allowed to provide for sponsorships, and they use the word advertising in the DIFCA law, as long as it is in the interest and supports community uh, peg operations, and peg operations is what it says. But it does use the word advertising in the different law, and he throws that up at the city council once a month, uh, and, and says that we, he is allowed under DIFCA to advertise. I think this is an extremely important issue that I hope will get resolved soon. But uh, he's claiming that he can advertise and that he can uh, go the full distance with the rate card, the 67 spots, the two minute spots. Well, I guess it's beyond the PBS guidelines. I mean, I, I guess to me, without the legal reading, what it, the way I would look at that is a lot of access centers have a policy that say you can't do any fundraising at all for any nonprofit except the organization itself can fundraise to sustain the organization. So maybe it's an extension of that thought because I think in a way you could, as the access organization running it, you could be advertising in a sense of. Um, Acknowledging sponsors at different price. I mean, if you look at what happens on PBS, use PBS as a model. It's pretty freaking commercial. You can basically sell ads for businesses at, at, at the end of each program, and so the access organization can do that. Sure, as so long as the revenue comes to the organization. But it's interesting because what he's proposing it sounds like is he'd be the middleman, yeah. skimming in a way. Right. Or I mean, I guess if you said you could, you could you commission a sales force to be selling spots on the access channel. If, if the net proceeds go to the access organization. And I think there probably is a legal finding that the organization can use it to fundraise the organization, but 
that other part that's really well, interesting. Well, that's why he wants to set himself up as yeah. a non-profit corporation to run. He'd be the non-profit, he'd be the organization, right? Right. Making a problem. So, I mean, it, it's possible that he's right in the sense that the organization running access can um, sell sponsorship spots. I mean, a sponsorship spot and selling an ad with a rate sheet, if, if, if you look at the way PBS in my neighborhood, the way PBS sells ads, they have a rate sheet. They're selling ads. It doesn't look like any kind of sponsored thing. So if I'm, if I'm interpreting it as you can do what PBS can do, basically you can sell ads. You might call it underwriting sponsorship. I mean, and, you, and we use that language really carefully. Well, the difficult law actually uses the word advertising, preface it, prefacing it by saying that all programming on community television stations shall be non-commercial. Right. And then goes on to say, however, they may use sponsorships and a few other categories, including advertising, to promote the station, to promote uh, programming, and to the extent that it supports local paid operations. Now, that's a very vague statement. It sounds to me like what it's saying is the access center can go out and advertise. It sounds like it advertises itself for people to see the channel. That, that's, I suspect that's what it is. I'm, I'm not that familiar with it. I just tried to find it online here, but it's. Uh, well, we, it's I mean, we talk about this distinction in our work, and then people say, oh, like PBS, check the end of this show. There's an ad on the end of the show for a local business saying, we're the best, here's where we are. Here's a, I mean, it looks like a freaking ad. Now, where, where the FCC has <laughs> and it's actually drawn the line yes. in the sand, though, is at, with the phrase, call to action. And the FCC has also said, you cannot initiate a call to action. That is open and frank commercialization. So they do draw some kind of a line in the sand by this phrase, no calls to action. Yeah, you can't say buy, and you can't even yeah. price. But, but, but certainly under the FCC regulations, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the call to, to fundraise on uh, the public channel isn't that kind of call to action. That's clearly yeah. permissible by the uh, under the FCC regulations. Well, he's not suggesting in his uh, uh, pitch to the city council that it be strictly for raising money for the nonprofit yeah. or the, whatever access management oversees LATV. He's talking about uh, a funding stream that would go directly into his nonprofit. Exactly. Well, this was a, I mean, I'm making a different political observation here, but there's huge cash flow that goes through high school sports programs, and there's huge subsidies of public facilities being used without compensation, and there's all kinds of dynamics in that room. So somebody who's involved in that world is probably thinking, hell, he's selling now the sports league, saying here's new money for the sports program. He's telling these guys, well, here's more, and I'll, I'll fund this for you. But anyway, so that's what it sounds like to me is a really interesting political thing. Yeah, but my sense is, is, you can interpret, is it, his interpretation is correct, and they were to do this. And as you soon see, difficult members, this cable industry is going to tolerate this. Yeah. Does your, does your organization have a, have a contract or agreement with the city that you will provide these services for a certain amount of time? Well, again, uh, as the chair of the LATP Commission, uh, I operate at the pleasure of the city council. So if we are directly under the city council, we are not, we are not buffered by a nonprofit. Uh, we are not a separate entity. We are a legislative body of the city subject to political fair practices. Do you also serve as the board for the organization that runs access? That's right. So there's no separate board? No. The commission is the board? The commission is the board. And it's not a 501 c with three organizations? No. It, it operates with the under the city of Los Alamitos. So the employees are employees of the city? We're not employees of all No, no, but the staff of the organization yeah, if are yeah. employees of the city. Yeah, at present, we do not have a, city, a, a manager for LATV. The commission is acting as a manager for LATV. The, oh, man, the city manager actually sits in on our commission meetings. Well, that's, that's not that unusual. Yeah. The places where they have to get a separate Nonprofit. Uh, it sounds like you've got a lousy arrangement. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the kind of arrangement that, that, that a, a good access center ought to have, and 
of that this is what Sean has, is you have uh, a contract with the city for a period of time, and so you can review it after five years or whatever, and they can only uh, terminate the relationship with you upon notice for good cause with giving you an opportunity to cure them. That's, that's the best way to handle it. So if the city wants to terminate the contract, it has to give you a notice for it. It has to have a good reason for doing it, and a good reason wouldn't be well. We don't like uh, some of the programming that's on the channel, but uh, I, I think having a contract with a period of time is a good fiscal responsible, fiscally responsible way for a city to, to deal with this. If they're going to get any money, then they file for money, and they ought to make sure that you, know, you report uh, what's happening and that uh, some kind of oversight. If you're in a little bit different situation, but any, any nonprofit uh, that's doing this uh, ought to have a contract with the city. Uh, they're good model contracts. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing the city should want. The city doesn't want to put itself, the city who's yeah, paying attention to what's going on, doesn't want to put itself in a position where uh, it can be deemed to be violating the First Amendment rights by uh, shutting down the channel. But, that does happen, but you know, I've, I've seen circumstances where uh, when the contract comes up for renewal, uh, and then all kinds of mischief can happen. Uh, so let the sports guy take it over and stack his board with a bunch of free speech advocates. <laughs> well, <laughs> he actually had a shot at that one time, but what he did do was pack his board with a lot of high school sports booster Of parents. course, yeah, no, that's good. And then, so therefore, every vote that came down was to promote sports at the expense of everything else at LATV. Yeah, and that right. really is the heart of my question. I could just bring my question to a point. Yeah. Um, mm. but, but the point of my question is, if this gentleman is able, uh, successful, at convincing the city council that he should take over LATV, the sports producer, and turn it into a little ESPN, um, and basically, within short order, eliminate public access from that equation. Uh, in other words, PA from the pay. So there's only education, which would suit the you know, high school quite well, and government program. The council meetings would go on as usual, and more probably, and sports would, would eclipse everything else. And he would essentially eliminate, uh, for all intents and purposes, public access. Can he do that? Well, if he could get the channel legitimately, probably. I, I ran an argument years and years ago, and I think a lot of you it, only it's never been tested in court. And while I think it's a very good constitutional argument, I, I wouldn't bet the ranch on it succeeding, and that's that uh, you can't have government access unless you have public access, because the government shouldn't take this resource and be the only speaker without providing an avenue for the public to also be the speaker. Now there are lots of places where there is no public access and there is government access. And this this has never been tested by the, the current uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, and probably less friendly towards these kind of arguments than we have had uh, 20 years ago when I wrote my law review article. But it's, uh, I think that's a good argument that uh, survives the straight face test. I think something I, I, I believe that's the way the Constitution ought to be. So the vulnerability for this guy would be if and if he rejected anybody's program, he'd then be in. He'd then have the liability as that as that entity, right? Assuming that it succeeded and it went that far, how's it going to crumble? I mean, then the next day, how do you how do you get it back? Yeah. Um, um, and so the you know, problem I would, you know, the argument then is what you, you must have a public access program. And you cannot discriminate on content, you can only do time, place, and manner. And then you apply those, you apply those principles back on him and say, hey, here's 10 great local access, here's public access, and if you don't air it, then we're taking you down. But you have to be ready, I mean, but I, that's, that's, my, that's my sort of strategic thought about it. If it is not, uh does not negate that in any sense. There's no language in Dibner that negates that requirement for public access to be a component of 
I don't think so. And, and even if it did, if it violated the U.S. Constitution. The problem is the burden would be on you to, to put the energy and to claim it back. It would have to be legal intervention. Or you could raise that issue in the front end, maybe, to get the city to not do it. Or to but the, 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 this is not a recommended uh, political solution or recommended legal solution. But, uh, yeah, if it's coming down to really statute the board, just really, you know, make the condition that the you know, majority of the board is people who will not go along with that plan, who will support public yeah. access. Yeah. But I know that in uh, Albuquerque, Contract came up for renewal with uh, the, the best bank public access corporation, law, which is called quote unquote. Uh, there was a change in the mayor and city council, and they didn't renew their contract and gave the contract to somebody who was uh, a buddy of the mayor's who uh, really didn't have the experience to do this. And there's litigation going on there by, I don't know, it's quote unquote, or members of the community or both of them. It turns out that this guy who they did give it to wasn't able to uh, get the channel on and wasn't able to do anything, so he was now gone. But uh, that was a uh, that was a pretty tough legal fight. I think the council shouldn't be uh, free to, uh, to uh, choose who it wants to run uh, public access as long as it wasn't doing it for content basis. And I think they probably recovered it. Clear what they were doing is they wanted to get rid of this uh, nonprofit uh, that existed and bring in their own nonprofit. Well, this produces an excuse for dropping public access from the education government uh, programming that would otherwise go on is that he, he can't, his marketing plan, it does not fit to his marketing plan because he cannot monetize it. And it's just dead, it's dead wood. It's a dinosaur, he calls it. And uh, it's been eliminated by DIFCA as required programming in his mind. And that he no longer is required to provide public access and would prefer to produce, to, to carry LAT beyond as a marketable item on the basis of that which can't be monetized. Well, if he wants to monetize his sports program, he'll put it on the internet. And I'm not bothering you. With this, but, uh, I, as I said, I, I'm not that familiar with that, but I'm, I'm that this is this is permissible under that. And the extent he's taking the word advertising, I'll, I'll bet it's taken out of context. But I should give you a disclaimer: I'm not licensed to practice law in California, so. Uh, so we, I have to take my argument to PUC. Possibly, but. Uh, PUC is going to tell you enforcement. We don't do enforcement. You're only at your own. I mean, right? This is what's happening under DIFCA. Is they'll say, look at the look at the statute. It says if you have, if there's any violation here, it's determined by a court, not by us. I think that's a general response. Well, yeah. well, well, what you might want to do is just ask them for if they will give an opinion of whether this is permissible, or you might want to ask the attorney general. The Attorney General might give you an opinion that this is uh, not permissible under this. That, that may be the better place to go. Okay, good advice. Well, our current work, LATB, I should add, is currently under consent decree as a result of the ACLU suit. <laughs> it's still under consent decree. So, it's, in other words, it's still being monitored by the civil liberty. You, no. know, you might want to ask the, good. ACLU, the, the ACLU to give this. Yeah. Advice, they probably. Uh, That's very helpful. Uh, actually. Bring a lawyer who, uh, who can understand things. And I can't imagine that they would tolerate this nonsense. So there's kind of three places to go: the ACLU or, or the Attorney General. If the Attorney General were to give you an opinion, uh, if I'm right about that, and Sean is right about that, then you get a good opinion. And if we're wrong, then. Uh, I guess you didn't have a chance anyhow. <laughs> but uh, it might be. I don't know who the current attorney general is, but uh, I think. Come on, nurse. Yeah. 
And, and I'd rather, I think if I'm where I, I'd rather go to the Attorney General than to the PUC. I think we have a sympathetic PUC, but their hands are tied by death. Can you explain what that is, please? What? That last word, DIPCA? Yeah, oh, it's a California a, a BIP law, the Digital Infrastructure and Video Competition Act of 2006. And it basically is the state video franchising law that affects local features, local franchises in the state of California since 2006. Well, if I'm not mistaken, isn't DIVCA the national law? No. That's the state law. The state law. So well, pursuant to 8029, 87. Yes. It's only in California that's a, not a good law. It's not as bad as a lot of state laws have gotten enacted recently, but it means that the Local governments don't issue the franchises any longer. It's the state that issues the franchise. And it's the state that, more importantly, it's the state that enforces the franchise. And it doesn't provide uh, adequate remedies to get the companies to behave themselves. Uh, whereas a, a good local franchise uh, would, would have. This is, this is a bill that uh, got enacted uh, uh, at the urging of AT&T back then. When was that? 2002? 2006. 2006. That's right. AT&T was running around right. and doing state legislation uh, in a, a new number of states. Fortunately, in California, we had a very active presence by uh, the access folks. Access Sacramento and, and, and Buskey and yeah. Palo Alto. And, and, and to less extent local governments who have all the lost thing, but access people that wound up getting the really good amendments. And uh, I don't know if you were at the opening plenary yesterday, before the opening plenary, uh, we were welcomed by Joe Sabidian, who was uh, a committee member there. He was a guy who gave folks the heads up that this was happening and worked very hard to prevent the access entities. Legislators like that, or, uh, all they did was uh, take the rough edges off. I mean, it still is a terrible bill. But he was able to. What does it do? What does it? Can you summarize that for me exactly? Well, what it, this, I basically repeat what Jim said, which is it it takes what was a local jurisdiction and removes it from the local jurisdiction and places it at the Public Utilities Commission. So the State over. Room. So the, the authority to oversee the franchise moves from your county or city to the state through the Public Utilities Commission. And the way it's written and the way you, and the Utilities Commission have never done this before, so they all have a whole new office now that's funded by this. And basically what they say is, hey, we receive the application. If it meets certain criteria, it's approved. What used to be a negotiation where you do a needs ascertainment and you identify community needs, that's... Uh, now we're still hoping, and I just, I, I gotta leave this with a hopeful note, that they're opening a proceeding on the renewal of DIFCA, because some people got into DIFCA license in 2006, 7, 8. They're 10 years, they're 10 year terms. They didn't, they, the PUC doesn't have rules yet on renewal proceedings. And the federal law has some really nice language about renewals that local governments have a role in a renewal. So we actually have a little, I mean, I'm not saying too much here, there's a, there's a proceeding right now at the PUC about what should our rules be for DIVCA renewals? But this is this is down the line. And on the front end, you lost it at first. And now you're trying to get it back. But, but what you did get in DIVCA, unlike some of the other state laws, is there is a requirement to keep the number of pipe channels you had before. Right. Now. right. And, and grandfather is what you had in 2006. Uh -huh. You had three channels, and it, you get to keep them. If you had 3% you get, or more of a peg fee, you can keep it. Not more. They put the ceiling at three percent, but it's based on what you had. If you had nothing, they put a floor. You can collect one percent now. So jurisdictions that were collecting zero have an opportunity to collect one percent. The language, though, attaches the peg fee to the federal law and a reference to that can be interpreted to say that it's restricted to capital purposes only. So there's another issue over there about the money. But it basically, the local government still collects their franchise fee. And you can still collect a peg fee of a, of one percent to three percent, mm -hmm. but if you had, but and so that's the quick outline. Very good, thank you. And, and some of the other state laws don't even have the 
require temporary. Uh, That's right. So uh, pet channels and provide for no funding. So uh, as bad as Defty is, it's uh, when AT and T wanted to go into business, it went around the states and uh, they blocked the uh, off state legislatures and they vomited really lousy legislation everywhere else. And the only two states where legislation wasn't awful were California and then Illinois, which Illinois uh, came after this. I, I worked on the Illinois legislation and we had kind of started with Def and we, uh, they made some small improvements, but Illinois was uh, much better off uh, without having this legislation. Well, you know, we had 7%. So well, you, you were cut to three. Well, no. We Five were, plus two, or anyway. Right? No, we were cut. We, have, we were 7% of gross under Time Warner. Verizon came in and lobbied the city very heavily and supported the mayor, the same corrupt cop from Bell, and who basically trashed the entire operation and then rebuilt it on the basis of one dollar per household which is just slightly above 1% for us. Whereas we could have gotten uh, up to 3%. Above the five, yeah. Above. In, in the so-called notwithstanding clause of DIPCA, it was right there plain, and then everybody just uh, turned their heads and gave, and, and then told us, well, it's better than 1%, it's about like 1.3% or something. But we could have gotten 3%, and uh, so it was, so the fix was in for us. You got a question? Oh, I, I apologize for jumping back, but there is one uh, music copyright question that, since you were here, I, I did want to ask. Every time the, the, the music copyright or any kind of copyright question comes up on the list, sir, somebody always chimes in with the suggestion that, well, the cable companies really have blanket licensing agreements with the major music publishers. So I wondered, in, in your experience, can you confirm or deny whether that is really the case. Does that exist? They, they have blanket licenses from ASCAP, AMI, and I think something with the other, or what's the other outfit? CSAC. Uh, CSAC, which uh, allows for the use of their music on the cable system, but that's in background music. And at one point, cable operators would say, well, that doesn't apply to the same channels. Um, it does apply to the pet channels. Uh, you know, they will talk again, negotiated for NC NCTA, which is the National Cable Television Association, negotiated this arrangement. The reason the cable companies cover the pet channel is that uh, you know, otherwise they would be liable if it's on their system. So anything that goes over the cable system is covered by the blanket license, but the blanket license is only for background music. It doesn't time and music that's synchronized to the, the program itself and for that you need a separate copyright. So, so music that might be a background to a, a, a bullet war would, right, would yeah. be all right, but a, yeah. a, 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 a taping of a band that is playing cover, you know, bits from the 80s uh, in the town square. Right. Uh, you want one that's... Uh, that would require yeah. synchronization rights. Yeah, and essentially that would be they play something in the public domain, so if they play Stephen Foster music, uh, you're, you're, you're okay. Or, you know, the, you know the, one of the best solutions is you have a local band playing music and then it's created itself. Now you want to make sure that they give you the permission to run it, but, they, but that's no problem. But yes, they, they can't uh, put out the performance uh, with copyright music without having uh, that the copyright, but my sense is it's not that difficult to do. You should probably probably have to pay some kind of small fee, particularly since you're using it on a, on a non-profit basis. Yeah. I work with a producer out of Minneapolis, and he and I have this discussion a lot. And he, uh, I do veteran videos, and so he'll he'll uh, your scenario you just said here, sir. Uh, where a band is playing and they're doing covers for music from the 80s. And every time I say to him, well, you know, we can't really air this without some kind of music release. He says it's fair use. Well, 
He's wrong, huh? Okay, so really, technically. Although, although I guess, you know, tell me as a practical matter, what I would say is we're not the cops. I'm saying it looks like you might have a problem, but you signed a contract with us, and you're the presenter. I'm not the presenter. It's your show. It's not our show. And I'm not, I can't stop you from airing it and testing that. I'm not the judge and jury. I'd go back. I mean, my default would quite honestly be just like it is with obscenity or slander. I can't, ju I can't determine fair use. I'm not, I, I can tell you what I think. I can, I can advise you. You might, you, might have a, you might be having a liability here. Make sure you sign the contract. I want your signature on my agreement promising me that it's not a violation of copyright. Okay, thank you. I have your promise to me. And now it's your show, it's not mine. Well, there, 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 there are those things that go into fair play. Are the, the amount to which you're using. If you're using to be thinking, well, there's a 30 second rule, which no really isn't, but if you're using less than 30 seconds out of uh, 30 minutes, you're okay. And, and you probably are. If you're using it for non commercial, it's, uh, it's okay. And if you're using it as part of a parody, you can use it. I mean, what if I just want to interview somebody on the side and the band's going on and it's in the background and I can't help it? No. Right. There are, there, there are other arguments to make for fair use, so I, I would hate to be the one judging it, whether it was fair use or not. So that's part of the discussion I have with him, is that I can't really air it without some kind of a release, because I'm theoretically the executive producer, and he's producing this in another so you state. But you are the presenter, you're not the channel, you're the producer of that program. Correct. Okay. Correct. So, so that is your problem, then. Not, not the, not the channel. I'm saying if you were the channel, you don't care. Because you're the one on the boat, not me. <laughs> but you care because you're the producer of the show. Right, right. And, I, and I don't want to get nailed right. because somebody else is not playing when I keep yeah. saying I gotcha. fair use to me means that fair use. I make everybody sign a release. Talent, location, music. And that's a good practice. Absolutely, because it's my butt on the line. Right. Okay? But I don't want to lose my channel because someone else is not playing. So what I've done is I've resisted even carrying this stuff on my channel. Yeah, well, that's a shame. But I, uh, I mean, I mean there's, there's different tactics you can take. You find somebody with no assets to be the presenter. Mm -hmm. If they're not collecting. I know, that's like I'm saying, it's gorilla. That, that's gorilla style. Yeah, yeah, but well, see, I don't want to do that. I, yeah. want, I want to do, you're going to use the music, get somebody to sign a release, yeah. and you're the producer of that segment, not me. Yeah. Okay, but see, what, what the thing about it is, is that, uh, that this, you said it was a cover band? Well, it, 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 like, yeah, they're playing cover like tunes. Said, the, they're, they're playing songs from the 80s and 90s, but somebody wrote that material. Well, he talked earlier about, uh, he talked earlier about, like, uh, maybe the franchise has a blanket, has a blanket, uh, a blanket uh, contract with BMI and ASCAP that, but it doesn't extend to the web, so. No, no, it doesn't extend to synchronization. What do you mean by that? So that means if I'm seeing somebody performing the music, the image is synchronized to the sound. If I'm using it as background on a bulletin board channel, then it's, it's not synchronized. The image is not synchronized to the sound. No, and there is a distinction in the rights, and the blanket rights do not include synchronization. Ah, uh, so theoretically, I really should not use it at all. Is, is what I hear you say because ultimately I'm I'm the producer of the series and it's going to be okay. very good. Thank you. I'll just tell him I can't do it when he sends me stuff that he doesn't have a release for. Wow. I think we're supposed to end about now, right? Yes, it's 320. Okay, so I won't go over if you have any further questions or anything that you have in the hallway. And then that's fine. Go ahead. I guess I'll see you in the car as well. Yeah, you do. We're going to talk about earlier talking about the recent uh, burial you know, from the safe harbor. Yeah. Um, one time we had a show. We had a show that everyone access briefly that was called The Music Preacher Lady. So what happened was that she wasn't naked at all. She was with the canvas wall. <laughs> as, well, as well as far as it went. So what happened, not because of it, but we our users, our users are so in tune to what's on you know, what's on our channels that you know, like a something you know, like a new six store new street uh, 
our regular station, the story of public access that we try to link us to it, we know we you know, we, know, we know what's on our channels enough to where it's like, you know, we can question where that come from. Um, you know, back in you know, a few years ago, channel KCRA three they did a story about public access. And you know, you know, at the bees uh, you know, are going, you know, you know, get the uh, get the, uh, the uh, residents pay the tax on it. So what happened was that they showed uh, in the in, in the piece they show uh, a choir, a guy that was dressed up like a bee, uh, and one guy running off a cliff, a cliff. And the thing about it was is that like we're like, where'd they get this? We don't hear this. I mean, and, and, we, and some of the producers actually took uh, took the uh, station to task, and they did a retraction the next night. Because I mean, because you know, that's why I say know your stuff. Yeah, I mean, maybe we kind of similar to. I would be unfortunate to live in a community like this where we no kidding. We, we don't have people that come in and try to put this program in. I mean, they're like, we were watching, everybody was like, the production over there, we were watching it, and they're like, wait a minute, do we have this? Wait a minute, that's not, are you, we don't hear that. <laughs> we're not in your mountains, where'd that come from? <laughs> I have one last question I'd like to put to the whole group mm -hmm. that, you know, that pertains to what we talked about earlier about commercialization. Do any of you folks know of, in California, of any pay operations that have made this transition to commercialization? I asked that question to Andy Folger, uh, to Andy, who's our ED over at uh, Media Center Palo Alto. No. In, in a word, yes. Sacramento, what happened was that when, when uh, they were coming in with uh, cable, they said that they were, you know, it was only supposed to be for uh, education, public access, and government. But then the powers that be at that time decided to throw in uh, KPIE, which is a PBS station. And then we had we ended up giving money to PB, uh, Channel 6, even though they are you know, they're doing on fundraising. And then a few years, uh, then about a couple years after they got that, they gave them a second channel, which is called KPIE 7. So that's all over. That they do commercialize and sell. Yeah, they do. They do. They do commercialize themselves. I mean, it's like they they do like about if you're if you're watching them during the fundraising period, you'll see about like three minutes of uh, books that underwrite under this program, and you see like spots you never see. But it's a local PBS enterprise. It's not a private. It's not commercial in the sense of. Well, it is. Well, see, what it is it is commercial because we don't have those. We can't do those. I mean, we get. I mean, we can do. We can do that at the beginning, at the end, but we can't do the fundraising things that they do, like you know, like like the, like the telephones. We can't say. Well, but because your own bylaws don't allow it, not because of any legal restriction. It is a legal restriction, even though you know. We're contractual. It is. It, it's, it's contractual, but the thing is, is that like we can't do, we can't go out and we do and do uh, telephones. We can't offer. We can't go out and offer. Say like, if you donate fifty dollars, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you something that. If you go to the store, if you go to the store where they sell it, you see it like about like much less. So you have no. But, but we can we we can do that. Our our, our policies, our, our own bylaws allow us to do all of that. We just choose not to be that commercial. In but terms of do any of your producers, or do you know producers at any pay in the state of California, who are being allowed to run commercial spots in the course of their programs? No. No. I. I will tell you our story that after about how we clamped down on a sports producer who had a rate sheet and was selling ads on the program that he submitted to us. We pushed back, and you know, anyway, because we wouldn't allow that. No, we ours ours we did you know there were allowed to do the PBS guidelines at the beginning and at the end, and uh, producer and uh, we started to find out that a couple we started to find out that a couple of our, of our producers are using equipment. To, uh, you know, to make money. And the thing and what happened was that uh, we were trying to go out, like some of us, you know, we've got community producers that want to go out and do stories like on, you know, like on homeless, on low sufficiency, you know, like you know, stories of human interest, like we, like we had done when we had a, when we had a big crew. 
But what happened was that we were looking a story about loaves and fishes, and we were trying to get, we were trying to uh, make contact with them. And they said, like, uh, we don't, we're not interested. We found out months later that a producer that was coming in from our organization was charging them to be put on the air, which is, you yeah. know, we can't, we can't do that. So, yeah, you know, does PIG allow for government side, the G in PIG, to offer to a, 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 an outside producer or entity the, the ability to work, to do uh, commercial programming on the G side of PIG? Who knows? No. Yeah. <laughs> there you have a real problem with the local government. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.